Hello, and welcome to the last lesson for our unit on thermodynamics and kinetics, in which we're going to discuss how uh, reactions work, which is called the rate mechanism. And we're going to tie that rate mechanism into how the rate laws, uh, what the rate laws actually mean. So uh, we've seen this sort of hinted at before. Let's get a little more uh, detail about this. A reaction mechanism is a sequence of elementary steps. Now, reactions take place. Reactions are more complicated um, than just a single two things coming together. And most, com most complicated reactions can't occur, and we'll see why in a few minutes, uh, with all of the reactions coming together at once. And so we have this sequence of elementary steps that represents progress towards an overall reaction where we have two things react and then they react with something else and so forth and so forth. So in this reaction that I've got illustrated here, I have two NO gas and two H2 coming together. Now, having four molecules come together with the things that we need, we need enough energy and we also need the right orientation. This is going to be exceedingly rare. Now, it might happen, and if it does, great, but there's going to be faster ways for a reaction to occur, and that's what we're going to be talking about here. Uh, the way that these reaction mechanisms are deduced is, number one, by looking at what the rate laws are, and we'll get into the rate laws in a moment, but then there's also more sophisticated techniques that we can't really get into that involve things like spectro spectroscopy and being able to look at uh, both what we, we're going to call the intermediates and also the, what the activated complexes are. So the energy diagram for this reaction is shown below with a proposed mechanism as follows. In this proposed mechanism, so we say proposed mechanism because we have to verify it, we have to correlate it with other things. In this proposed mechanism, the first thing that's going to happen is that the two NO molecules come together to make N2O2. And we're going to assume that this step is fast. Now, when we have this diagram, you're going to notice that each step, so we got one, two, three elementary steps leading from the beginning to the end. We're going to, each step itself is going to have its own activation energy. So this step is going to be represented by activation energy one, which is going to be the amount of energy to get from where the reactants start off to get up to that first activated complex. Notice it's a relatively short activation energy. Now, in the next step, that NO2 that we just created is going to come down and it's going to react with one of the hydrogen molecules and it's going to make NO2 and H2O. Now, before I get to there, sorry, let's go back up a moment. That NO2, sorry, N2O4, N2O2 exists in this trough. So this is like a first product. But this product doesn't stick around for very long because the N2O2 itself is going to be reactant. So as you come along, we're going to see that we're going to start with our reactants. Here we're going to have what's called an intermediate. The N2O2 is an intermediate. That's way down below, but let's write that in there down here now. The N2O2 is an intermediate. We'll talk about how an intermediate, how you think about an intermediate in a few minutes. So the N2O2 now reacts with one of the hydrogen molecules. And this step is going to be slow because it's going to have a large activation energy, EA2, which is going to go from the bottom of the, the trough here, where that intermediate was. By the way, you can actually collect the intermediate. You can, um, if you stop the reaction, if we were to take out the hydrogen, then we would collect the N2O2. What happened to my line? So here's my line. We're going to have one of those again. And the activation energy goes from that line up to the top of the second peak. 
So that's our activation energy number two. Now notice the activation energy number two is the largest activation energy. That means it's gonna be the slowest step because it's gonna take the most energy, most kinetic energy is needed. This slow step is an important step. It plays a very vital, vital function in the reaction and it's called the rate determining step or RDS. And we'll get back to this rate determining step in a few moments. Now, at this point, to understand how a rate determining step works, I want you to pause this video and go and watch one of the other videos that I've got associated with this called the funnel chain. And you're gonna see how different sized funnels can be made to represent uh, different activation energies and indicate which the slow step is. It's basically a bottleneck, if you will. Now, let's keep going. I'm gonna change colors just to make things a little easier to look at. This N2O, N2O that's produced, here we have N2O, here we have H2O, which is one of our products. So we've now got one of our products, but we've got N2O, which is another intermediate. We've got one of our reactants left over, the H2. So in the third step, in the third step, EA3, we're gonna react that N2O with the H2 to make our final product, N2, and our last water molecule. So now we've made all of our products. We used up all of our reactants. And the third step, the activation energy goes again from the bottom of that intermediate trough up to the top of that activated complex. And that's our activation energy three. And you notice it's smaller than activation energy two. So it's a faster step. In any reaction, there is always going to be one slowest step. That's the rate determining step. That's the step that's going to determine how fast the reaction goes. Now notice in this diagram up above that we have one activation energy for each elementary step. And as I said, the largest activation energy represents the slowest rate determining step. Keep that in mind as we go through this lesson. Now the intermediates, intermediates can sometimes get confused with catalysts. And we'll talk about catalysts at the end of this lesson uh, when we just, uh, we're gonna go back and look at the elephant toothpaste uh, experiment, elephant toothpaste reaction. N2O2 and N2O are considered intermediates. And the reason each one is produced in one step, and it's an earlier step, and um, is consumed or reacts in a subsequent later step, but they don't appear in the overall reaction. One of the things that you have to make sure when you look at a me reaction mechanism is that the, the sum of the steps must equal, after you've canceled out those intermediates and as we'll see any catalysts, must equal the overall reaction. And looking up above, oh, reaction, not reaction. Looking up above, if we were to cross some things off, we could cross off the N2O2 and the N2O2, we'd cross off the N2O and the N2O, and we'd be left with our two NOs and our two hydrogens, we'd have our one N2 and we'd have our two water molecules and there would be our overall reaction. Okay, so hopefully that makes clear what a reaction mechanism is and what the energy diagram for a reaction mechanism should look like. Now let's tie this reaction mechanism or any reaction mechanism into how the rate law works. So let's see how this works. The rate law is going to depend on the number of species, number of each species, so the number of each molecule in that rate determining step. So the rate determining step is actually the step that determines the rate law. Because it's the slowest step, 
it's going to be where the molecules have to come by come come to react so let's assume we have this reaction in which molecule a collides with molecule b in the rate determining step a plus b makes c now c can be an intermediate c could be the final product it doesn't matter if we look at the way that collision theory works it should make sense to you that the rate law must indicate that you have to have one a molecule reacting with one B molecule for this reaction to occur, and that the rate law must, oh, sorry, must be that the rate is K times A times B because the number of collisions is proportional to the concentration. And so as the concentration goes up, the rate's gonna go up because you have more chances for making collisions. All right, so what we have now is the step, first step at looking at what a rate law must be. Now, in this rate law, we have two things. In this, in this mechanism and rate law, we've got two things going on. We've got the rate law, A times B. We've got the mechanism, A and B where in the A and the B, remember, we have those, uh, I really wish this wouldn't jump around when I accidentally hit something. So we've got this, the coefficients one and one on the A and the B. Again, a nice simple step, two molecules coming together to, to form whatever the, the product or intermediate is. So if molecule A collides with molecule B, in that rate law. It's gonna be first order in A, this is the coefficient for A in that step, and first order in B, and that's the coefficient for, the, for B in that step. So the rate law always matches the stoichiometry. The rate law matches the stoichiometry, not of the overall reaction, but in the rate determining step. How would this work for a second order reaction? If we were to require two A molecules to collide, so we got A plus A combining to form whatever that intermediate is, this rate law should be second order. Why is that? Because the rate, if we go from up above, the rate's going to equal K times the concentration of A times the concentration of A. Right? That's representing at A plus A goes to C. But we can also represent that as 2A going to C. So we can represent the rate. And it comes just comes right from the math as K times the concentration of A squared. And so we get this, this second order rate law whenever you have two A molecules combining. So in that first, let's scroll up to that first reaction. In that first reaction, it rate uh, number uh, reaction number one was in the rate determining step. But if it had been having those two NO molecules there, that would have been how we would have gotten a second order in NO, and we'll see more about this as we get down below. So there's several different possibilities for all of our rate determining steps. And if you turn the page, you'll see the different possibilities. As I said, the coefficients, that's the stoichiometry of the reactants in the rate determining step are the orders in the rate law. If we have a single reactant, going to products, then that's going to be a reaction that's first order in A only, and there's nothing else there. As we saw up above, if we have two A's coming together, that's going to be A squared. As we saw up above, if we have an, a single A and a single B, then that's going to be a rate that's A times B, first order in A, first order in B, but second order overall. If we have three A's coming together, that's going to be a way to get a third order in A. This is a very rare thing to happen. If we have two A's and a B coming together, that's going to be second order in A, first order in B, 
Again, third order overall. And finally, we could have three different reactants needing to come together. And that would be first order in A, B, and C, but again, third order overall. So always look to see what's the, what are the coefficients and what are this, the chemical species that exist in that rate determining step that will get you your rate law. Or if you've got the rate law, that's going to tell you what chemicals you must see in your rate determining step. Now it won't necessarily tell you what your products are, but it will tell you what your, what the um, reactant should be. So let's now tie it all together with a nice big bow and look at how the mechanism and the rate law coincide. As I said, the rate law always matches the stoichiometry of the rate determining step. So the first thing you wanna do is determine which step is the rate determining step. So I have this reaction that NO2 and carbon monoxide are going to react to form nitrogen monoxide and carbon dioxide. And we propose that it takes place by the following mechanism. Not necessarily the, uh, just the, the two molecules coming together. Suppose we need two NO2s in the first step to come together to make NO3 and NO. And that's the slow step. So the slow step tells us that this is the rate determining step. Immediately you know what the rate determining step is. So you can now write the rate law. The rate law is going to be, don't forget that K, you don't know what it is yet, but you still have to put it in, times the concentration of NO2 squared. So, so there's, no, there's no CO in there at all. And you'd be looking to see that if you were to uh, have a series of experiments in which you you varied the concentrations of the NO2 and the CO that you would get this result. Why is the reaction zero order in CO? Look at where the carbon monoxide comes in. The carbon monoxide doesn't come in until after the rate determining step takes place. So basically what's happening here is the carbon monoxide, right here, carbon monoxide is basically waiting. I'm going to put it in quotation marks because it's not really waiting. Waiting for the NO3. And it reacts as soon as you see that NO3. And so it really doesn't matter what you do to the concentration of the CO as long as you have some carbon monoxide there then it's going to, it's always going to react as soon as it can. So where the carbon monoxide shows up, carbon monoxide appears after the rate determining step. And this is what is going to um, be a characteristic of a zero order reactant. It's still a reactant, you still need it to complete the reaction, but it's basically, it reacts as quickly as, as the reactant that it needs or the intermediate that it needs is there. By the way, the intermediate. Uh, the intermediate is NO3. So NO3 is an intermediate. And we use one NO2. Now there should only be one NO2 used. We use one NO2 that then gets reformed. And so there's not really a word for that. It's just sometimes you do reform the, the reactants as well. If you cross those off and you cross off the NO3, then you will get, and let me circle everything and let's use like blue for this one. We have NO2 and carbon monoxide makes NO and carbon dioxide. There's our overall reaction. So this mechanism fits. Now, let's see how a catalyst fits into all of this. Let's go back to the, the mechanism which you saw for the elephant toothpaste previously. And that reaction mechanism had H2O2 combining with iodide. So here we have some iodide. It was potassium iodide. And it forms 
H2O, which is one of our products. So H2O2 is our reactant. H2O is one of our products. And let me change colors. Let's use purple. I like purple. Let's, let's um, use purple. Uh, leave that in, in blue. We make this, this hypoiodite. This hypoiodite then, and that's our slow step. So this is our rate determining step. This hypoiodite then subsequently gets used in the next step and it reacts with another one of our hydrogen peroxide molecules. So there's our two hydrogen peroxide molecules and it forms another one of our H2O. So there's our H2O and there's the O2 that it forms. And look at what's left over at the end. Now I am gonna change colors on you. So the iodide, oh, the iodide goes in here and it comes out here. It's not part of the overall reaction. And I'm gonna circle that iodate, hypoiodate, iodite, sorry, in purple again. So that overall react, that overall I minus does not show up in the overall reaction. So that's the idea behind a catalyst. This catalyst is present in the rate determining step. It is regenerated in a subsequent step and does not appear. in the overall reaction. However, oh, reaction. However, because of the way the mechanism works, the rate determining step is the H2O2 and the, and the iodide. And so let's see, one last color change. Here's our one H2O2, here's our iodide. That's our rate determining step. And so the rate law is going to be that the rate is equal to K times the concentration of the H2O2 times the concentration of the iodide. And we are done. So we've got our homework for you. Oh, um, there's another video for you to watch on catalysts. And so go back and watch the uh, catalyzed oxidation of uh, potassium, sodium potassium tartrate catalyzed reaction. This is actually the pink catalyst. So you'll see how this works. You'll see where the pink catalyst comes in and you'll see, um, you'll see how, uh, how it regenerates. All right. So uh, we will see you next time in class and uh, we will go over this, this, the notes and the homework, and we will also go over the, um, the lab, the, the iodine clock lab, and make sure everybody's on the same page with that. All right, have a good day.